Hello, everyone, and thank you so much to the American Association of Geographers for the honor of delivering these remarks today. I am particularly humbled to receive your Atlas Award, especially when I read the list of past honorees. My remarks today involve a call to geographers to help build the resilient planet of tomorrow that will sustain our children and grandchildren. Let me begin by listing the trials of our time. Stopping climate change, promoting sustainable use of resources, reducing inequalities, halting pandemics, promoting public safety in response to natural and man-made hazards, increasing healthy lifespan, of course, among other issues. All of these are features of the physical world and of human activity on the planet. Often, these two concepts, the physical world and the world of humans, are so tightly coupled that progress cannot be made without considering both simultaneously. This is the space, that coupled human environmental arena, where geographers have always felt comfortable and have always made outstanding contributions. Now, today my challenge to geographers is to adopt new approaches to addressing these challenges. I invite you all to open your mind to, first of all, disruptive technologies, a diversity of value systems, a diversity of backgrounds of the people you work with, and transdisciplinary approaches to problem solving. So let me begin with disruptive technologies. We all need to be receptive to new ideas that challenge the status quo. And the example I'm going to uh, use today is that from satellite altimetry. CSAT was the first satellite altimeter that was launched in 1978. Its mission was to better measure Earth's sea surface elevation so that physical oceanographers could resolve currents by differencing the actual sea level with the geoid or Earth's equipotential surface at sea level. However, I remember one day when I was a graduate student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, when one of the physical oceanographers came up to me and said that CSAT proved so precise that it resolved small scale elevations in sea level that were presumably caused by excess mass of seamounts and other bathymetric features on the sea floor, which had previously never been resolved in the geoid and were unmapped due to the sparse ship coverage in the oceans. The conventional wisdom at that time was that the only way to measure seafloor relief was to use sonar deployed from ships. When I heard this news from CSAT, I thought, Eureka, that it would be possible to more easily and more cheaply map the seafloors using spaceborne instrumentation. So um, I, I joined a team that inc included two researchers from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena who had access to the altimeter data. And um, Stu Smith from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, who had compiled all of the sonar data on the oceans, which could be used to calibrate and test the ability to resolve bathymetry from satellite altimeter data. Together, we published this first paper that proved that bathymetric prediction from altimetric data was possible. My contribution to this team was to come up with the spectral filters that look for the sweet spot in order to recover features from altimetry uh, between um, features that were 15 kilometers and 150 kilometers in uh, dimension. At longer wavelength out in this part of the spectrum, uh, one needed ship soundings because the altimetry had no resolution at the very long wavelengths. And at shorter wavelengths, you needed to use swath bathymetry. And the nature of this filter, because it would blow up uh, noise at the longest and shortest wavelengths, 
we created a notched filter to predict uh, bathymetric features that were previously unmapped in those scales of 15 to 150 kilometers. Now, this turned out to be um, a, a pretty good way to map the oceans, as you can see from these maps that uh, compare different generations of maps. The first maps of the Pacific, very grainy, that were put together in the 1960s to uh, the better maps in the DBDB series that came out in the 1970s. And then finally, after CSAT was launched in 78, these much better maps that were done from very uh, expert processing of the satellite altimetry data. This one is by Walter Smith and David Sandwell. Uh, they put it out in the um, 1990s. And you can see by comparing these maps, how many more features are resolved. Um, this map shows the ship tracks in this area of the ocean superimposed on a map of the United States. So that you can see that without the satellite altimetry data, there were holes in the shipboard data that were the size of Montana and uh, North Carolina, in which there were not a single ship sounding. Now, not only did this provide better maps of the seafloor, but it actually was a huge benefit to ship navigation. I'm going to show you a ship track that uh, I ran in the 1990s um, along here. And uh, you can see the ship track on the ship track map right there in the South Pacific. And uh, one thing we were, uh, we were on a transit uh, at that time. And there had been a feature that showed up on both the NOAA charts and the DBDB5 uh, maps that was called Favored Bank. It first appeared on a map by Captain Cook. But when we looked at the satellite altimetry data in planning the route for this expedition, we found nothing at the location of Favorite Bank, even though it had been mapped by Captain Cook. Instead, we found another feature 100 kilometers to the west that was not a feature on any of the maps. And we felt that Favorite Bank had been mislocated by Captain Cook by 100 kilometers or about a degree in longitude, which was easy to uh, understand how that could happen because the only way to get longitude at the time of Captain Cook was through uh, chronometers and they were not very precise. So as we were going along, um, we passed over Favorite Bank as located by Captain Cook and indeed there was nothing there. As we continued west, I called up to the bridge to say that we were going to be crossing um, what could be a very shallow bathymetric feature and the bridge better be alerted that we might have to uh, do some maneuvering at the last minute. So the captain sent uh, a crewman up to the uh, flying bridge of the ship. Uh, it was in the dead of night. And I remember about half an hour later hearing on the squawk box in the lab that the crewman up on the flying bridge saw breakers dead ahead. Uh, and uh, he saw it because of the moonlight reflecting on the waves. And so we did a quick uh, maneuver to uh, miss that bank, but now it is correctly located on all of the ship maps. So this is just an example of how being open to new ways of solving problems from complete left field uh, can really benefit um, solution to uh, real world problems. My next point I wanted to make is to team up with those who value uh, science differently than you. You don't have to go it alone and you will be more successful if you don't. So this uh, story um, starts from the time that I was director at the Monterey Bay Aquarian Research Institute, otherwise known as Imbari in Moss Landing. Um, the, uh, at the time, the Institute was having trouble with teamwork among the different divisions, science, engineering, marine operations, and education and outreach. And when we did a personality test 
for all the people at the institution, we found out that they actually had self-sorted into different kinds of, of value systems. For example, the one uh, personality test shown here in green was basically the sole personality type in the scientists. And the only thing that they valued was getting it right. If you don't get it right, what's the point in doing it? They didn't care about schedule. They didn't care about budget. They didn't care how anyone felt about it. You just were a failure if you didn't get the problem right. Whereas the engineers fell into this gold personality type. They really cared about process, about solving things correctly. The engineers might uh, admit that there were many solutions to a problem. There is no right one, but there is a, an appropriate process that you have to go through with preliminary design reviews and final design reviews. And uh, of the many solutions, you needed to choose the one that um, fit uh, what you wanted to optimize. You might want to minimize cost or uh, minimize schedule or minimize risk. And so you needed to tell them which solution you wanted to optimize that solution. On the other hand, we also had people in our marine operations division and they really cared about, did you actually get the job done? It didn't matter if you had the best possible solution or you did it in the right way, but if you can't get the job done, it was useless. So they would go out to sea with a fancy new device that the engineers had built. And when they'd bring it back at the end of the expedition, the engineers would say, what are all these tie wraps and what's all this duct tape on this? We had a beautifully engineered system. And the marine operations people would say, well, you know, it wouldn't clear the A-frame and the wire didn't fit the shiv. And so we had to jerry-rig it, um, but hey, we got the job done. We're a success. And the engineers would say, well, where are all the change orders? And the marine operations people would say, we don't care about all your paperwork. We got the job done. And then finally, the people in the education and outreach group, they really didn't care about getting it right or following proper process or getting the job done. What they really cared about was how did everyone feel about it? And if, if people were really unhappy, that it didn't matter if you got the job done or you got the right answer or you used proper process. Once we understood how these different personalities approached problem solving, it was much easier to get teams to work together, to value what value systems other groups brought to the problem and to understand their ways of thinking. Now, this all came to um, a head when I later joined um, the Department of the Interior as director of the USGS and had to work to end the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the largest marine oil spill in US history. We had a great team in uh, Houston working on it. We had uh, great engineers uh, from BP, um, we had the director of Sandia Labs, Tom Hunter, the secretary of energy, uh, Steve Chu, the uh, commander of the Coast Guard, Thad Allen, um, great scientists from USGS. And we found that by taking advantage of the different ways of thinking of all of these people, we could actually end the oil spill. So for example, the USGS scientists were um, this you know, green type of personality, and they wanted to get it right. They wanted to solve the right problem. So they were tasked with what questions should we be asking? At, uh, the, the way we finally um, decided to end the oil spill was to put a capping stack on to shut the well in from above. But then the USGS scientists said, there are things that could go wrong if in the initial explosion, rupture disks in the 16 inch liner failed, then by closing off the easy route of egress for the hydrocarbons off the uh, top of the well, um, we might actually force the hydrocarbons to leak 
through these failed rupture discs and we could turn a single point of egress into multiple points of egress for the hydrocarbons if they hydrofract up through the mud into multiple leaks into the Gulf of Mexico. So we would have made a simpler problem into a more complex problem. So the USGS scientists set to try to understand um, what kinds of questions we had to answer to make sure we weren't making a bad problem worse. Then the DOE engineers figured out if that is the problem we have to solve, how do we actually solve it? And the way they looked at this, um, I use an analogy here of a garden hose. If I've got my garden hose turned on full blast, I should get full pressure out the end of the hose. If there are leaks in the hose, either a single leak or multiple leak, then there will be less pressure out the end of the hose. So the engineers figured if they put a pressure valve on the capping stack, that would be like putting your hand against the end of the hose, you could determine how much pressure's on it. And if the pressure starts going down with time, then what that would mean is leaks were starting to develop in the hose, one leak or perhaps multiple leaks as the oil uh, goes out um, the liner in the well and starts hydrofracting into the Gulf. So the change in pressure would be our indication of um, a dangerous well situation. So once they had a good design for this, the BP engineers got her done. They hired the best contractors, they planned to the nth degree, they considered every contingency and they executed the emplacement of the capping stack flawlessly. And Thad Allen and the people from the Coast Guard developed a communications plan. They considered all stakeholders in their communications. They considered every outcome and they didn't hype the operation. They made sure that everyone was okay with it. And thanks to this great teamwork, the capping stack effectively shut in the Macondo well on July 15th in 2010. The pressure sensor data was analyzed to provide confidence that hydrocarbons were not escaping elsewhere into the Gulf of Mexico. And therefore, uh, because of this teamwork, the oil spill was effectively ended two months ahead of the date that the well was completely killed by cementing it from below using relief wells. This successful operation was thanks to exceptional teamwork by all of these people approaching the problem with their own um, contributions that they would excel in. So I really encourage all of the geographers to think about those who have different ways of thinking than them, different value systems, and how you can benefit from that. But that's not enough. We also have to worry about fighting inequality. We have to diversify the people even within that green circle who are asking the right questions. We have to diversify even those who are in the gold, who are finding the right solutions. Um, and we have to do this in order to reduce inequality. Now, we know that even before COVID, there was growing inequality in the US. Rush Chetty, an economist at Harvard University, used digitized census data going back to the 1940s. And this is a year in which a child is born and the probability of the child earning more than their parents. For children born in the 1940s, 90% of them in the US exceeded their parents' income earning. Whereas by the time you got to a child born in 1985, who was you know, off in the workforce by 2005, it was 50-50 that they would exceed their presidents in their parents' income. It was just a, a flip of the coin. And um, Ross showed, I'm sorry, this is a grainy map, but he showed that even that inequality is unevenly distributed in the US, where the children that are least likely to exceed their parents' income are in the Southeast, and the children most likely to exceed their parents' income are in uh, the Midwest. Now that was before COVID. COVID turned out to be an amplifier of inequality. 
so that during these COVID years, the disadvantaged are not just poor, but they're also dying at increased rates. And the reasons for that are that they're most, most likely to be essential workers and therefore on the front lines of exposure. They're more likely to have pre-existing conditions and therefore going to fall more ill if they do get COVID. They're less likely to be able to socially distance from other family members, so they spread the infection to those around them. And there's also a legacy of distrust of the medical community that is remnant from the Tuskegee experiments on syphilis, in which African-American men went untreated for a perfectly treatable condition. And for that reason, the African-Americans are less likely to trust the medical community when they suggest that they should get vaccinated. And you can see here the data where um, in Louisiana and in Chicago, African-Americans are about 30% of the population, and yet they're about 70% of the share of COVID deaths. So what can we do to reduce um, these inequalities? Well, we have to tackle the many dimensions of inequality and the disadvantaged need to be involved in all four of those um, circles, the green, the gold, the orange, and the blue. They have to be involved in asking the right questions. They have to ask questions which, which pertain to their community, not just the white community. They have to be, and those are the greens, they have to be involved in the goals. They have to be involved in seeking the solutions that counter rather than increase inequality. As I said, the goals are the engineers. They see many solutions to a problem, but which of those solutions decrease inequalities and which of them contribute to inequality? And then in implementing the solution, the people in the, of the orange personality type we have to implement solutions in an equitable manner. We have to make sure that um, the disadvantaged communities are not the ones who are always bearing the brunt in the implementation of how we do uh, greener energy uh, for climate change or uh, how we solved problems in um, uh, resource allocation. And then finally, they also have to be involved in that blue uh, type of communicating to diverse stakeholders. If it is only um, one um, racial group that is doing the communicating, we will fail to appropriately communicate. And then finally, my last topic is embracing the transdisciplinary. No one discipline can solve the complex problems of the 21st century. So we need people with different ways of addressing problems, um, different, um, we need uh, greater uh, diversity in those who are solving the problems, and we need to take a transdisciplinary approach. Um, this, the, the catchword right now for um, addressing problems uh, through transdisciplinary approaches is convergence. And convergence is the integration of engineering, physical sciences, computation, life sciences, and the social sciences with profound benefits for medicine, health, energy, and environment. This definition came from an Academy's report in 2014. The example I wanna use is the science of earthquakes. Building resilience from seismic events involves geologists to tell us where are the faults, geophysicists to determine how much shaking is expected from the maximum earthquake that could occur on that fault, taking into account the soil type, bedrock, et cetera. We need geographers who say, but how does that shaking relate to the human environment, to buildings, to infrastructure? We need structural engineers who can come up with new designs to minimize the damage of that human environment from the determined shaking. We need architects who can take those structural plans and actually turn them into designs. We need policymakers who will make those designs part of zoning uh, laws. And we need economists to look at the cost benefit. How much engineering is too much? 
how much of it is the right amount to actually get a good cost benefit in lives saved and infrastructure damage that is foregone. And then we need communicators to talk about the risks to communities and to get them to accept these new designs. So when I was director of the USGS, here was um, the sequence of events that happened. First of all, the uh, USGS scientists came up with a hazard map of um, where in the country were the hazards highest from seismic shaking. And um, so what areas were really needed to be the focus of better um, zoning laws. The USGS scientists then worked with engineers to come up with seismic provisions for new buildings and retrofitting old buildings. Those were finally uh, incorporated in 2012 into international building codes. And those building codes were accepted not only in the US, but also many other nations that are subject to seismic events. Now today, when there is an earthquake, it is rare that someone actually dies from that earthquake in nations that have accepted these building codes. And that's an example of um, this transdisciplinary kind of problem solving and the sorts of people that need to be involved. And finally, just let me say in closing, to address the challenges in promoting sustainability, in building resilience, and in fostering human well being, will require new approaches to problem solving, as I've just laid out here. And I urge all geographers to be part of these solutions. And before I take questions, let me just end by showing here a picture of um, one of my grandchildren who happens to be named Atlas. He's two years old. And the reason why I care so much about all of this is I don't want Atlas to have the weight of the world on his shoulders as he grows up. And I hope that you all will work with me today to make a better world for Atlas and children like him. So thank you very much.